read about some animals who decided to start a school. I don't know why, but they did. The, the courses were running, climbing, swimming, and flying. And so they decided that every animal has to take these courses. And that's where the problems started. You see, the duck was better than his teacher in swimming. But he made only passing grades in flying and was really poor at running. So they made him drop out of swimming class, and he had to stay after school to practice running. Poor guy. And this caused his wet feet to really get bad and worn out. And so his grade in swimming dropped to average. Yeah, it was bad. But everybody felt less threatened because now it was more competitive and, and more comfortable with that except the duck. Now the rabbit started at the top of his class in running. But because of so much makeup work and swimming, he caught pneumonia and had to drop out of school altogether. The squirrel showed an outstanding ability in climbing, but he was extremely frustrated in flying class because his teacher insisted that he start from the ground up. And so he got a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle... <laughs> The eagle was a problem student from the beginning, was disciplined for being a nonconformist over and over again, but insisted on using his own way to get up to the top of the tree. And because he refused to participate in swimming classes altogether, the eagle was expelled. We are God's workmanship. He made me me. He made you, you. And you are intricately designed just like those animals. And when we begin to do things that we weren't designed to do, problems happen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God prepared in advance for you to do, for me to do. He prepared these good works specifically for you. You are his workmanship. He does not have any shame in workmanship. He doesn't make mistakes. God prepared in advance what was going to happen in your life, what you were going to do, how you're going to feel most fulfilled. Uh, when you got at the center of his will and you surrendered all, like we just sang, the Bible says that you were formed, that you and I were shaped, that we were created uniquely by God and for a purpose. And he put us on earth for a reason. We're not here by accident. We are his workmanship. Now, how do you know what God's purpose is for your life you look at your shape. How God has made you, how he's formed you, and that's an indication. It's not, we can't really put our finger perfectly on it. We have to work it out, work that shape out. But that is going to give us a big indication of what he wants to do and how he wants to use our life. We've been in a series called You Are Shaped for significance, and we're looking at five factors, S-H-A-P-E. S was spiritual gifts, and those are for people that have made a commitment to Christ to use a supernatural endowment and a supernatural gift in order to accomplish ministry. Not everybody has that because not everybody is a believer in Jesus Christ and has a personal relationship with him. H, that's your heart, your passion, your motivation. Today we're going to be talking about the A in shape, and that is abilities. Abilities. 
And lastly, uh, we have P and E, which we'll talk about them later on, uh, next couple of weeks, and then I'll be gone for a few, and then we'll finish up with experiences, but that is P for personality. You have a unique personality, a different personality than the person next to you for a reason. God shaped you that way, and E is experiences, both bad and good. God never wastes hurts. These are what make you you and be me. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6, it says, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit who gives them. We've covered that. There are different ways of serving, or different abilities. But the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service. But God gives ability to everyone for their service. The factors that make you you. We looked at, like I said, spiritual gifts, and we are going to focus in today on that third letter, A. Different, there are different abilities to perform service. That's what that scripture said. We're all given different abilities in life. They are... They're not given to a person when they become a Christian, like a spiritual gift. They are born with you. In fact, God placed these abilities in you while he formed you in your mother's womb. We're all given different abilities. Uh, physically, we're all shaped differently, right? Some of us are like bananas, some of us are like pears, some of us are like apples. It's obvious that people are different. None of us are alike. Physically, we're shaped different. Not all of us were made to be basketball players. Or not all of us were made to be jockeys on a racehorse. You don't have the physique for it. LeBron James was made for basketball. I think that's pretty clear. Years ago, at the Ironman Triathlon Contest in Hawaii, the first 10 people who crossed the finish line looked like they were right out of a cookie cutter. Identical build and body structure, they were made for that kind of sport. Some of you were made to be bodybuilders. You've got the form, the physique, uh, some of us, we can pump iron all day long, and we're never going to get too much bigger. That's how we're made. A lot of us, we're never going to be ballerinas. Some of us are going to be able to draw amazing paint. We have natural abilities that we kind of drift to. Some of us can write. Some of us can play an instrument. I'm jealous of you. You're just not made that way. Some of us, we're just not made that way. We're made different. We have different abilities. Some of you, you have an ability to help calm someone down and let them know it's okay and that they're not alone. Some of you know instinctively when someone else is in pain and you know how to alleviate that pain. Because we're all different, we need to accept that. And that's where a problem comes in because sometimes we don't want to. The problem is when we expect everybody to have the same abilities. Just like it would be silly to expect everyone to look the same, it's silly to expect everybody to have the same abilities. Makes me think about that story of the animals. And the point was, is that God has designed every creature with certain abilities to excel in certain areas. And in those areas in which you are not gifted, or you don't have the abilities, you're not going to excel. A duck could swim. He wasn't good at running. God built that way. Not made that way. And when we force somebody into a mold that they are not able, they do not have the ability for or gifted for, it leads to guilt, it leads to frustration, it leads to mediocrity, it leads to failure. A duck is meant to be a duck, shaped to swim. An eagle, 
his mate to fly. A squirrel, they climb a tree really fast and then jump from branch to branch. You're meant to be you. I'm meant to be me. Nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's look at some facts about your abilities, your assets. Number one, every ability is given by God. Romans 12, 6, God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. Rick Warren, uh, he said this, he goes, I, I don't think we as Christians, we, em we emphasize natural abilities enough. I think we overemphasize spiritual gifts to the detriment of natural abilities. Some people imply that spiritual gifts are more important than natural abilities. That's not true. If you're a Christian, there isn't that much difference between spiritual gifts and natural abilities because it all comes from God and is to be used for God. Sometimes you get around Christians who tend to imply that if you're just committed, you can do anything you want. You know that's just not true. I can be as committed as I can be, but I'm still never going to sing like a lot of famous singers. I can relate to that. I like to sing. I really do. But with me, it's making a joyful noise. Uh, and, and to be very honest, I am amazed at people that can sing or play instruments. And I tried. I've tried to play instruments. So I remember when I took up guitar and I sat down and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And I could finally get down Amazing Grace, kind of. But it just didn't. I just, and then I have somebody else can pick up a guitar and they're inflated, and all of a sudden they're strumming. And how do you do that? That's their ability. I don't have that. But I've always had a real easy time at picking up sports. It was never hard for me, whether it was basketball or golf or baseball. It was pretty much any kind of sport. I just needed a little practice, and I did fairly well. I have that kind of ability, but like I said, I, I, I'm just amazed at people that can play instruments or sing on key. Uh, I remember my son humming when he was little, this is Ben, and he was humming some of the song and he was right on key with it. I'm thinking, how do you do that? I can't do that. I have to have Margaret next to me singing. Even then I can't pick it up. The Bible says that God has given us different abilities. It's all important. God gives the ability to do carpentry just like he gives the ability to teach. I had a kid who was an awful driver last week, and I had to be really patient. And um, <clears throat> I got a little nervous when he would make a right-hand turn and wouldn't turn back, and we were aiming toward the front lawn of this beautiful house, and the guy's out watering his flowers watching us. Um, you know, I, I can do that though. I can be patient with them. It, it works for me. Tell me to speak in front of a thousand people. No problem. I make dinner for 12 people. No problem. I'm pretty good at it. But tell me to schedule the doctor's visits and keep track of their schedules or upload my phone to the cloud or download something and I'm just a mess. I'm a nervous mess. I have no idea what I'm doing, and honestly, it scares me. Now, my wife, she handles that with ease. Or at least, it looks easy. You make it look easy. Uh, I, I, I get frazzled. I get crazy. She's effortless. My friend Franco, uh, Franco can walk into a room or a house, and he can see what's not there. The man is an artist with wood. He's great. He's awesome. His, his ability allows him to do that. Pete. Um, Pete used to work for Con Ed. Most of us know that years ago, uh, before he retired. And a couple of years ago, I remember when, when we had the big storm come through and our house didn't get hit at all. We were so thrilled. The next, the next week, there was a little windstorm, and we had this tree fall in our front yard and ripped the electric wires right out of the house. And so, uh, 
Con Ed came, we hired an electrician, and the electrician did his job, he put it all back on, but we had to wait for Con Ed to come out. Now this, we walked into church and, and uh, um, we didn't have any electric, it had been five days, and we were waiting for Con Ed, they were giving us two weeks. And um, I said something and Pete heard me. Next thing I know, Pete's over there, over there, he's over there on the phone. Margaret walks into church, and what? A few minutes later, Pete walks over her, and Margaret is leaving, and Pete said, Con Ed is on their way to your house right now. And by the time I came home, we had electric. And the guy, my electrician, came in, and he said, who do you know? <laughs> We're like, what do you mean? He goes, they don't jump like that unless it's somebody big. And the guys that came and fixed it, they said, Pete is such a good guy. He's, he's, he's the real deal. Now, I don't know what a bit, the actual ability that is, but there's, there's something there, right? Pete did that. I could get on the phone and talk all I want to Con Ed. Nothing's happening. God shaped us. He gave us abilities to serve others. And I think that's a perfect example of serving others. You and I, we're no different from that. Scripture gives a, a long list of abilities that God gives. It says in, in Scripture that God gives these abilities. Again, yeah, God gives these abilities. Here's just a few. Athletic ability, artistic ability, architectural ability, administering, baking, barbering, boat making, candy making, debating, designing, embalming, Embroidering, engraving, farming, fishing, guarding, leading, planting, poetic ability, philosophizing, a machinist, inventing, carpentry, sailing, selling, being a soldier, teaching, tent making, writing literature, all abilities. And these are just some that we see in Scripture. But God says, I give them to the world. I give them to through people. So the first thing is every ability that you and I have, every ability is given by God. The second point is that every ability can be used for God's glory. If God gives it, it can be used for his glory. The truth is, that's why he gave it to us. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Anything can be done. Any of the abilities can be used for the glory of God. That's why that we give it. Researchers have said that the average person has between 500 and 700 abilities. Many of these you and I, we don't even know about. Each of those can be used for the glory of God. You can repair a car to the glory of God. You can balance financial books to the glory of God. You can make a meal to the glory of God. You can manage your office to the glory of God. You can make a sale for the glory of God. You can catch a football or shoot a basketball for the glory of God. There was a guy, some of you might know him, a guy named Paul Anderson. Anderson, I love that last name. Paul Anderson. And Paul is considered one of the strongest men to have ever lived. He once lived lifted 6,270 pounds in a back lift. That's over three tons. <laughs> During his weightlifting career in the 50s to the 70s, he broke all kinds of records, he won gold medals, and he's actually considered the godfather of weightlifting. What many people don't know is that Paul Anderson's passion was Jesus Christ. And he established and started the Paul Anderson Youth Home, which still operates, and it's for troubled kids to go and get straightened out instead of going to jail. He used his ability to build the youth home. It's come into recent news because uh, of a donor uh, that gave money to the Paul Anderson Youth Home, and his name was a guy named Truett Cathy. Some of you know that name. Truett Cathy started Chick-fil-A. 
Uh, and although Paul has long since died from kidney disease that he had from birth and struggled with all his life, Paul's duty continues on, and the Paul Anderson new poem is still growing. There's a guy who was a monk, and he swept floors. His name was Brother Lawrence, but he swept floors to the glory of God. After he died, he wrote a book, or should I say someone wrote a book based on his journal called Practicing the Presence of God. Um, wow, that is a classic. If you've never gotten it, it's a small little book. Get it, read it, um, eat it up. Devour it. And, and, and what about this woman named Fanny Crosby? She was born in Brewster, not far from here, right? March 24th, 1820. She died in February 12th, 1915. She was an American mission worker, a poet, a lyricist, a composer. She wrote more than 8,000 hymns and gospel songs with more than 100 million copies in print. And by the end of the 19th century, she was a household name. But what people don't know is that she was the only child to her father who died when she was six months old. And she was raised by her grandmother. But get this, she was also blind. Blind. She played the organ, the piano, the harp, the guitar. She sang, she spoke before Congress. On behalf of the blind, first woman to speak in the U.S. Senate, did concerts at the White House, and was personal friends with the then president, Grover Cleveland. Bedridden toward the end of her life, she was still writing hymns. God gave her abilities. She used them. And today we see many who use their abilities as a platform for God's glory. Deuteronomy 8.18 It says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Did you ever think about that? You can make money to the glory of God. God gives the ability for some people to just produce wealth. A true Kathy, I think he's an example of that. The man donates an awful lot of money. He was the one that, well, we'll get to him later. God gives the ability for some people that can sit down and just recognize where they need to invest and how much to give. And God says he gives the ability to some people to make wealth. I know we'd all like to be them, <laughs> but we won't be. But so many of us, we sit around and we try to figure out ways that we can get money while these guys and women, they're sitting around thinking how they can give money away. Nice problem, right? You're saying, how can the ability I use in my business to make a deal or close a deal, how, you know, you're telling me that, that being a salesman is an ability? It sure is. Hey, there was a guy, a guy who was a shoe salesman. His name was D.L. Moody. He was a shoe salesman who loved Jesus, so he started selling Jesus. And he since got home a long time ago, but we have so many things because of him. Some of you have heard of Moody Bible Institute, among many others. The first thing we need to do in regards to our abilities is recognize where they come from. So we say, God, I, I realize that you gave me the ability to make these deals. You gave me the ability to engineer this project. You gave me the ability to close that sale. Recognize God. And, and scripture throughout scripture, it's telling us to recognize God, to acknowledge him. <clears throat> I think we bring glory to God when we do that. I think we bring glory to God when we act ethically and morally. You don't cheat people. Um, when we provide legitimate service or projects or, or products, when we help people, that brings glory to God, I believe. I, I think we bring glory to God when we give them back the first 10% of our money. That's called a tithe. And God says you do this because you recognize 
that he's the one that gave you the ability to make the money that you're making. It's not that God gets 10% back, you see. It's that he's letting you keep 90%. But it's all his. It all belongs to him because he gave you that ability. So you bring glory to God in your business. I think God has blessed a lot of men and women uh, in this church with all of the abilities we're talking about. It's obvious. He, he, he did it to bring glory to himself, not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of other people. I think God wants some of us to be so successful in whatever ability he's given to us that in making money so that we can use it as a platform to talk about God, use it as a, a benefit to boost up ministries. He's given us these abilities, whether it's sweeping floors or making music or teaching or making money, and it's all given for his glory. Every ability is given by God, and it's for God. The third thing is my ability to show God's plan for my life. In other words, what I'm able to do is what God wants me to do. When it comes to planning your career or retirement these days, how do you know the right thing to do? There's so many options. How do you know the right way to go? Do what you're good at. Do what you're good at. Maybe, maybe it's going to change the way it looks after a person retires. It won't be the same, but it will be the same. Sometimes we think, okay, I'm done. God's not done with any of you or me. So we never really retire. I was talking with Tony last week, and he was saying how busy they were in their retirement. I think John Caputo is another example, too. The man's always busy. He's retired. Aren't you supposed to kick back, lay back? Take it easy. But you have abilities, and you, God's not done with you. Hebrews 3.21, God will equip you with all you need for doing his will. God has a will for your life, and that will includes what he gives you to do. And he doesn't ask you to do something you cannot do. That would be cruel. God didn't randomly access a bunch of abilities and then pile them. <coughs> it's not by accident that you have the abilities you've got. A good ind indication of his will for your life is to simply look at the abilities he's given you. Why would he give them to us, then waste them? Think about that. Why would he give you these unique abilities and then waste them? Looking at my shape, my abilities, that can point me in the direction that I need to go, what I need to do. And understand, it doesn't matter how old you are. As I said, some retired people are working harder now in retirement than they were before, doing what their abilities allow them to do. He's got work for you. You are here. You're not home with him. You're here. Why are you here? Because he's got something for you to do with your abilities. Age doesn't matter to God. Think about that. Age doesn't matter to God. It has Time doesn't matter to God. He called Moses to free a whole nation and take them to a promised land when he was 80. Abraham was over 100 years old when he had his first son. And he would be the father of nations and fulfill God's promise. Paul was an older man when he wrote a lot of the New Testament. His eyesight was going 
Check it out. Read your Bible. So many of the most productive moments and productive years and impacting years were not when a person was young, but when they got older. Age matters to us. To God, it is just a number. And to God, Scripture tells us one day is like a thousand, and a thousand is like one day. Translated, age has no matter to him. And what he wants to do and how he wants to use his people is his choice. My dad had me at an older age. He was retired when I was in high school. I never shot baskets with my dad. But my love for basketball came from him. He was my motivation. He played when he, he was younger and he loved the game. He threw a baseball with me a bit, but not much. And yet, he never missed a game that I had in the room. He was a salesman, an insurance salesman. I remember whenever I got in that game, I'd look over there, and there's Dad leaning against the fence with his overcoat on. He had just gotten off work, and he was there watching me. When I played basketball in college, the King's College, when it was here in Briarcliff Manor, my dad did not miss one home game even while his son sat the bench. You know how that made me feel? Do you know what that did to me in here? I can't even tell you. And it would almost make me cry because I had teammates and they would say, yeah, I can't remember the last time my dad came to a game. And they all knew my dad. They all knew him. Hey, Mr. Anderson. He did that when he was older. And he built my self-esteem. He did so much when he got older. There aren't enough bombs. I learned much more from my father after he got older than I did before. I think of all the wisdom that he gave me. I can remember, I was a youth pastor, I was having problems with these girls, two girl sisters, and one of them was, was really a mess, thinking about suicide, and the sister was, they, they had problems. And I remember getting on the phone with my dad and saying, Pop, I don't, I don't know how to, how to deal with this. And he took a little breath and goes, son, Every kid is different. Some need encouragement. Some need a swift kick. <laughs> you just got to figure out which is which. My dad taught me how to die, too. I'll never forget when he was laying in there on the bed. And I had to take his leg, see, because diabetes and infection set in. And he was having a tough time controlling bladder and all. And I remember him sitting there feeling disgusted because he couldn't get up, he couldn't walk. He had to have nurses come and clean him up. And I remember him saying, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. It's never over till it's over. And if you're here with breath, God has a job for you to do. My calling and my abilities will often match. Your calling and your abilities will often match. They go together. God put them together for a reason, for a purpose. That's your calling. Your call to know him and to serve him, Scripture says he planned in advance good works for you to do. And until we get in on that plan, we're going to be frustrated with life. My calling and my abilities go together. What I'm able to do is what he wants me to do. What I'm able to do is because he's given me the ability to do. 
He doesn't want me to do something I don't have the ability for. These abilities then help determine his plan for my life. There's a book. It's called The Sea Zone. And it says that every one of us are, operate, uh, us are operating on any point in the day on one of three performance zones. And it determines how we feel. The first zone is what the author calls the panic zone. Now, the panic zone is when your abilities don't match the task that you have. You're in over your head and you know it. What am I, what am I doing in this job? How did I get this task? I can't do this. And you feel stressed out. That's what he calls the panic zone. If, if I were to ask you to preach for the three weeks I was on vacation, for some of you, it would propel you into the panic zone. You're not equipped for that. It's not how God made you. On the other end of the continuum is what he says is the drone zone. And the drone zone is where the task is so easy and so predictable and it doesn't use your, much of your talent or your ability and you're bored out of your mind. There's no challenge. There's no enjoyment. It's predictable. It's boring. You've got a 100% ability and maybe this task is using 5 to 10% and you're bored. And in between those two zones, the panic zone and the drone zone, is the C zone. Confidence, commitment, control. The C zone is where your abilities are matched the task that you have, and you feel challenged by what you're doing, but you're not stressed out because you have a certain measure of control. You know that you have the ability for this. You can handle the situation. That's the C zone. A guy by the name of Bob Buford, he calls this the J zone. It's the joy zone. That's where you really enjoy your job, your life. God wants you to live your life, at, or rather, God wants us to live our life in the C zone, in the J zone, where your competence is there because he's given you the ability for it, and that allows confidence. You're confident in the abilities he's given, but you're confident in him, himself. And you're capable. You're in control. That's part of what God's plan is for your life and my life. And four, on our abilities, and I want us to hear this. If I don't use them, I'll lose them. They're kind of like tax deductions. If you don't use them, you'll lose them, right? Matthew 25, 28. I don't know if you remember the parable of the talents. And he brings one guy in, and he did really well with what the master gave him. He brings a second guy in, he did really well. Third guy he brings in, he had, he had one talent, and he, he said, I knew you were a hard man, uh, reaping when you didn't sow, and, and so I was afraid, so I buried it. This is what he said, he goes, the master said after this, he goes, take the talent from him who didn't use it and give it to the one who made 10 talents. The idea is God says to whom much is given, much is required. Since all of our abilities came from God, then God says, if I don't use the abilities he gives, or if I misuse them and don't use them properly, he has the right to take it back. That's what the Bible says. If you don't use the abilities or you misuse the abilities God has given you, he has the right to take them back. This is a universal law. If I don't use something, then I eventually lose it. If I refuse to exercise, I lose muscle. If I refuse to practice, I lose talent. If I refuse to think, I lose my mind. It goes dull. Those, are you, those of you who are employers or were employers, if you have a, an employee that doesn't use his ability to do the job, what do you do? You give them the walking papers. You don't use it, you lose it. There, there's no employer that I know that wants somebody to stay when they're not living up to their potential, when they're not using their abilities. 
If you don't use them according to those abilities, you will lose them. Every one of us, we have unused abilities, assets. All of us do. And what I am talking to you about is how to defrost frozen assets. How to get those talents out of neutral and start using those abilities. Because obviously, we've all got between 500 and 700 of them. And I'll bet we have a lot we're not using. One day, you and I, we're going to have to stand for God, and God's going to say, what did you do with the ability I gave you? What did you do with the abilities I gave you? And he's going to wait for an answer. I don't think we're going to be truly fulfilled in our lives, at least to the degree that we would like, until we begin to defrost those frozen assets. He's given you abilities. He's given me abilities. He's given them to us in a compliments, the spiritual gifts he's given, it compliments our heart and our passion. It's going to work in conjunction with our personality and the experiences he's allowed in our life. It's going to help identify our shape. Use it or lose it. Christ died on the cross so you and I could use the abilities God gave us. He paid the price so that we could be free to be all God wants us to be. So that we can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and experience and understand how he's uniquely shaped us. What a wonderful thing. We're not accidents. We're not mistakes. And he put us here for a reason and he gave us a relationship with him for a reason because he loves us and he wants to see us fulfilled in this life but he also wants us to use our abilities for his glory. As we prepare for communion, think about the abilities that God has given you. The ones that you're aware of. Are you using them? And again, as you use them, it might be in a very different way in arena, but you're still using that ability. Some abilities you might not even really recognize yet. How cool is that? As long as we have breath, we have abilities that we haven't identified. That's kind of like a journey. That's kind of like, like a safari of some kind. I mean, that would be, that's exciting. There's more to you than meets the eye. Think about that as we dwell on what Christ did and the price that he paid so that we could activate, activate all he's made us do. Maybe we can have a couple of gentlemen come up and distribute the elements and then we'll come up.